Hey guys, God bless. Welcome back to my channel. I am Charlene. Welcome to another Bible reading. Today, we will be reading for day 77 and we're reading Deuteronomy 21 to through 23, which isn't a lot, looks like. Okay, let us pray. Oh, Heavenly Father, we thank you and we give you all the praise, the honor, and the glory due your name. Help us to get through this reading today. Help us to retain what we read. Help us to share it. Help us to comprehend and understand it, Lord God. Lord, you are awesome and you are wonderful. You are everything to us. We love you and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Let me get comfortable in my seat here. Oh, Lord. Okay. Let's get to it, y'all. I am reading from the Inspired Faith Bible. Exhibit A. This looks like this. This is the New Living Translation. This Bible was gifted to me. I don't know what it retails for anymore. Because um, once I get a Bible, I kind of don't look back on it. But I thank God for all my gifts and all my subscribers who are blessed to me. Because I'm pretty sure when y'all give me stuff, y'all have no idea how I'm going to use it. But God said this is the Bible to read through. So we're reading through this Bible. But anyway, 21. When you are in the land the Lord your God is giving you, someone may be found murdered in a field and you don't know who committed the murder. In such a case, your elders and judges must measure the distance from the site of the crime to the nearby towns. When the nearest town has been determined, that town's elder must select from <clears throat> excuse me, the herd a heifer that has never been trained or yoked to a plow. They must lead it to lead it down to a valley that has not been plowed or planted and that has a stream running through it. There in the valley, they must break the heifer's neck. Then the Levitical priests must step forward for the Lord. Your God has chosen them to minister before him and to pronounce blessings in the Lord's name. They are to decide all legal and criminal cases. The elders of the town must wash their hands over the heifer whose neck was broken. Then they must say, our hands did not shed this person's blood, nor did we see it happen. O oh Lord, forgive your people Israel from you, whom you have redeemed. Excuse me. Do not charge your people with the guilt of murdering an innocent person. Then they will be absolved of the guilt of this person's blood. By following these instructions, you will go what do what is right in the Lord's sight and will cleanse the guilt of murder from your community. Verse 10, suppose you go out to war against your enemies and the Lord your God hands them over to you and you take some of them as captives. And suppose you see among the captives a beautiful woman and you are attracted to her and want to marry her. If this happens, you may take her to your house where she must shave her head, cut her nails and change the clothes she was wearing when she was captured. She will stay in your house but let her mourn for her father and mother for a full month. Then you may marry her and you will be her husband and she will be your wife. But if you marry her and she does not please you, you must let her go free. You may not sell her or treat her as a slave for you have humiliated her. Whoa. So obviously humans, you know, someone was captive. You, you know, they may have found her attractive and she may have been beautiful to them. And he gave them a procedure to go by. Which is interesting because I'm thinking if you take away, you cut the nails, you shave their head and change their garments, would you look at her the same way? Well, actually, well, if your heart is in the right place, then yes. You know, because we go through that in marriages all the time where the body changed. They don't look the same, but we said unto death do us part. So even in this instance, God said, look, even if she don't please you, let her go freely. Don't hurt her. Don't kill her. So like I said, God is fair and just all the way around, even when we're the one who put ourselves in predicament. Verse 15. Suppose a man who has two wives, but he loves one and not the other, and both have given him sons. And suppose the firstborn son is the son of the wife he does not love. When the man divides his inheritance, he may not give the larger inheritance to his younger son. The son of the wife he loves as if he were the, as if he were the firstborn son, he must recognize the rights of his oldest son, the son of the wife he does not love by giving him a double portion. He is the first son of his father's for for virility and the rights of the firstborn belong to him. So 
God is saying, even if you feel some type of way about the mother, you don't really love her. Y'all falling out of love. This and third, you wouldn't marry somebody else and have a son. You cannot use your own feeling emotions to take away the rights of your firstborn. And you know what's interesting about this? Modernly, let me give you the equivalent of that. Like if a man marries and have kids, right? And the marriage doesn't work out. So he kind of neglects and abandons that family. And then he gets remarried and has a new son. And that son gets all the like glory and the rights of like being the first when they actually wasn't. That happens all the time. And it is not fair. Like whoever was born first, they were born first, despite the situation or the circumstances. But that simply does happen. If y'all don't know, I am in a blended marriage where my husband had previous ch children and I had a previous child. And guess what? I recognize his oldest son as my own. Well, both his sons, uh, first and second son, are older than my son. So I wouldn't have their thought to think, well, my son is superior over them. He is born last. He is the last baby son, right? So the old eldest son is still the eldest son and he gets eldest son rights because he is the oldest. So, well, thankfully, I don't think that way. But like I said, a lot of times when men get into new relationships, they do it. They abandon the previous children and they kind of pedestal the children they have in their new marriage to the woman they love. But God is letting you know right now that it's not okay. Verse 18, suppose a man has a stubborn and rebellious son who would not obey his father or mother, even though they discipline him. In such a case, the father and mother must take the son to the elders as they hold court at the town gate. The parents must say to the elders, this son of ours is stubborn and rebellious and refuses to obey. He is a gluten and a drunkard. Then all the men of his town must stone him to death. In this way, you will purge this evil from among you and all Israel will hear about it and be afraid. Modernly, I'm thinking about how we don't want to accept the fact, you know, when our children mean us no good and mean us more harm. It is, and a lot of people frown upon this and, oh, don't get me started when people get in their feelings that that's your child, you're supposed to stick by them, da, 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 da. Biblically, absolutely not. You can love them, but if they're causing you trouble and turmoil, whether it's in your immediate life, or in your overall family life, or just your existence, you have every right to exile yourself. And people of the church tend to do this, but people frown upon it and say, wait, wait a minute, that's your child. Prime example, I believe it's John Piper, who is a theologian and he's on fire and he's very knowledgeable for the Lord. And his son, I believe is an atheist. His son is going about his business and he does his thing, right? And he, he grew up raising him because the Bible said, train him up. You do that part, but sometimes that part doesn't work out. And <clears throat> we have to remember the prodigal son, right? Like he welcomed his son back, but he never stopped him from, you know, from being out there. Like if your child would not adhere to your faith, then you have every right to say, okay, you can't live here. You can't be here disrespecting my God and disrespecting us in our home. Like, especially if they've grown anyway, they're supposed to leave. But once you train them up to an adult, then they go about their business, right? And if you don't feel that way, I ask that you pray about it because it's not an easy decision. I'm not saying like, if, it, if I was in that predicament, would I be able to just say, hey, go about your business? But I'm telling you, if you allow them to disrespect your God and rebel against you, you're going to do more harm to you and your family then let them go about them themselves, their own business. Verse 22. If someone has committed a crime worthy of death and is executed and hung on a tree, the body must not remain hanging from the tree overnight. You must bury the body that same day. For anyone who is hung is cursed in the sight of the Lord. And this way you will prevent the defilement of the land the Lord your God is giving you as your special possession. So remember, who was hung upon a tree is cursed. So all the curse and evil wickedness fell on Christ as he was on the cross and he took all of that for us. And God had to turn his, turn his face away from him because he was evil. He was wicked. He had took upon all the sins of the earth. That's a big deal. What the way to end the chapter, right? <laughs> chapter 21. Now we're going to go on to chapter 22. If you see your neighbor's ox or sheep or goat wandering away, don't ignore your responsibility. Take it back to its owner. 
If its owner does not live nearby or you don't know who the owner is, take it to your place and keep it until the owner comes looking for it. Then you must return it. Do the same if you find your neighbor's donkey, clothing, or anything else your neighbor loses. Don't ignore your responsibility. This is serious. This has been said so much. Or at least twice. I don't know why I said so much, but you get my emphasis. We know that when things are repeated in the Bible, it's emphasis. And right there, God is saying, hey, you are responsible. You are your brother's keeper, or in this case, your neighbor's keeper, right? Where if something's lost or something's wandered, don't turn an eye from it. Like, don't turn away. Be responsible. Find out who it belongs to. If you can't, hold it until you do. Especially when it comes to like pets and animals, which here in, you know, in smaller towns in the country, people don't mind doing that. They'll hold a dog. We've held a dog before. We've seen that it had a leash and a tag. So we was like, oh, this dog belonged to someone. So we fed it. We watered it. We took care of it. And we called the number and we kept it until they came and got it. And that was the responsible thing to do because you would want someone to do that for you if they found your possession. And you would want to make sure that it's in one piece when you get it back and that they've done all they can to respectfully taking care of it. Verse four, if you see that your neighbor's donkey or ox has collapsed on the road, do not look the other way. Go and help your neighbor get it back on its feet. A woman must not put on men's clothing and a man must not wear women's clothing. Anyone who does this is detestable in the sight of the Lord. God does not change, remember. He does not change. Y'all have all these trends and even, this is what I pointed out to my children. I said, this relaxed look, this baggy pants, big t-shirt look is intended to neutralize humanity. Because if we're all wearing baggy pants and we're all wearing oversized shirts, Who's to say who's who? Like the hairs have been interchangeable, right? Like we're going to neutral hairstyles. But as Christians and believers in Christ, someone should be able to say you are a woman and someone should be able to look at a man and say you are a man. There should be no confusion. Confusion is not of God. Remember that. If you happen to find a bird's nest in a tree or on the ground and there are young ones or eggs in it with the mother sitting in the nest, do not take the mother with the young. You may take the young, but let the mother go so that you may prosper and enjoy a long life. When you build a house, a new house, excuse me, you must build a railing around the edge of its roof, flat roof that you will not be considered guilty of murder if someone falls from the roof. So be responsible, you know, build things accordingly. Something so simple, right? Like don't shortchange your building, like build a safe roof. <laughs> You must not plant any other crop between the rows of your vineyard. If you do, you are forbidden to use either the grapes from the vineyard or the other crop. So don't cheat the system. Like don't try to multitask your soil, which is not good for it anyway. You must not plow with an ox and a donkey harnessed together. You must not wear clothing made of wool and linen woven together. You must put four tassels on the hem of the cloak with which you cover yourself on the front, back, and side. So this is something that my husband brings to attention when people say um, you're supposed to, we're still under the law, right? Because, um, you know, if, we, if you don't know that we believe you are under grace, however, we believe you don't throw the law away. So if you want to adhere to this, cool, but don't make it a condemnation to somebody else. Like, for example, me personally, I actually naturally agree with this. Um even in my natural shopping and things of that nature, like I prefer cotton clothes. I don't like mixed uh, clothing, not because of basically what it said here, because I'm not sure why God said that. Besides the fact of he made a distinction between his people. But other than that, the clothing that are 100% what it is feel better and look better. Like a 100% wool sweater doesn't look anything like anything else. Like when you start mixing uh, materials and things, things start to look inexpensive. They don't last as long because what's the main thing that they throw in the loop? Polyester. You know, it gives it that scratch to make it seem like you're getting more, but it quickly can be ruined and torn because of the scratch. For instance, if you get like a 100% cotton t-shirt, that bad boy is woven together. Like it will take a lot to rip through that. But like I said, for me, I love 100% fabrics and blending does not feel comfortable on my skin even. 
but I could be just weird, you know. <laughs> Comment down below if you feel the same way. Like, do you have a particular fabric you like to wear? Have you take consideration to whether it's mixed, blended, or all natural? Verse 13. Suppose a man marries a woman, but after sleeping with her, he turns against her and publicly accuses her of shameful conduct, saying, when I married this woman, I discovered she was not a virgin. Then the woman's father and mother must bring the proof of her virginity to the elders as they hold court at the town gate. How would you do that? Her father must say to them, I gave my daughter to this man to be his wife, and now he has turned against her. He has accused her of shameful conduct, saying, I discovered that your daughter was not a virgin. But here's the proof of my daughter's virginity. Then they must spread her bed sheet before the elders. The elders must then take the man and punish him. They must also find him 100 pieces of silver, yikes, which he must pay to the woman's father because he publicly accused a virgin of Israel of shameful conduct. The woman would then remain the man's wife and he may never divorce her. As the wife, do you think you would want to stay there if he's <laughs> trying to get rid of you? But suppose a man's accusations are true and he can show that she was not a virgin. The woman must be taken to the door of her father's home and there the men of the town must stone her to death. For she has committed a disgraceful crime in Israel by being promiscuous while living in her parents' home. In this way, you will purge this evil from among you. If a man is discovered committing adultery, both he and the woman must die. In this way, you will purge Israel of such evil. Suppose a man meets a young woman, a virgin, who is engaged to be married, and he has sexual intercourse with her. If this happens within a town, you must take both of them to the gate of the town and stone them to death. The woman is guilty because she did not scream for help. The man must die because he violated another man's wife. In this way, you will purge this evil from among you. So even God is saying, speak up. Speak up. If a man is violating you and he's raping you, molesting you to speak up, God is for speaking up. That's something that I don't even think I even think like that when, when I was going over these verses prior, like, but it's very clear right here that he does not want you to keep, if someone done evil wickedness to you, don't keep it to yourself. Speak up about it. Um, what I was about to say, I was about to mention something else up here. Um, all of this obviously is about sexual purity, right? And obviously even here during this time, a lot of these criminal offenses involved guilty, guiltiness on the woman's behalf because that was more evident. But I'm still, you know, scratching my head on how would the women prove their virginity and how will a man, you know, be unaware you know like that's still you know yeah i have questions but yeah verse 25 but if the man meets the engaged woman out in the country and he rapes her then only the man must die do nothing to the young woman she has committed no crime worthy of death she is as innocent as a murder victim since the man raped her out in the country it must be assumed that she screamed but there was no one to rescue her so we can't say what she did or didn't do if we weren't there, right? Suppose a man has intercourse with a young woman who is a virgin, but is not engaged to be married. If they are discovered, he must pay her father 50 pieces of silver. Then he must marry the young woman because he violated her. And he may never divorce her as long as he lives. So God was making sure to say, hey, protect the right of the woman. If you want to lay down with her, then you need to marry her. And I find it interesting that modernly there is almost absolutely no consequences to fornication and adultery um, besides the gossiping, right? But I would even go, well, actually in divorce court in some states, there is penalty. Like if it's proven that you were an adulterous person, then there is a penalty. But um, I, for sure, fornication is, is almost like it never was forbidden. It's almost accepted. Like everyone's talking about sets and how much they like it and, you know, how they're freely doing it and they're not married and it's very distasteful. It's a shame. Um, I talk to my teenagers as often as I can. I talk to them blue in the face. Like, look, God still cares about this stuff. Even if society is making it normal, it is not okay. Keep yourselves pure, my boys and my girls. 
But anyway, now we're on, what, chapter 23? We're almost done, y'all. If a man's testicles are crushed or his penis is cut off, he may be admitted to the assembly of the Lord. He may not be admitted to the assembly of the Lord. Okay. If a person is illegitimate by birth, neither he nor his descendants for 10 generations may be admitted to the assembly of the Lord. Yikes. That's a, that's a big deal. It says 10 generations. Wow. No Ammonite or Moabite or any of their descendants for 10 generations may be admitted to the assembly of the Lord. These nations did not welcome you with food and water when you came out of Egypt. Instead, they hired Balaam, son of Bill, from Bethel, in distinct Aram, Aram Naharam, to curse you. But the Lord your God refused to listen to Balaam. He turned the intended curse into a blessing because the Lord your God loves you. Which proves what I said about people who say... Um, people, you know, cursing you or people speaking or wanting your downfall right here is proof that whatever God wants for you is going to happen. Like no man is going to be able to come and take away what God has put in place. And that's one of the things that I actually kind of hate. I hate when people say people speak ill of me or people praying on my downfall. Like, okay, if they are praying, it won't succeed because that is not God's will. God's will will prevail. And my faith is in the Lord, not man. I don't know. Maybe it's just me. I just get really routed about that because I'm like, don't you believe in God? Verse six, as long as you live, you must never promote the welfare and prosperity of the Amorites or the Moabites. Do not detest the Edomites or the Egyptians because the Edomites are your relatives and you live as foreigners among the Egyptians. The third generation of the Edomites and Egyptians may enter the assembly of the Lord. Okay, so the third generation is quicker than the 10th. <laughs> wow. When you go to war against your enemies, be sure to stay away from anything that is impure. Any man who becomes ceremonially defiled because of a nocturnal emission must leave the camp and stay away all day. Toward evening, he must bathe himself. And at the sunset, he may return to the camp. You must have a designated area outside the camp where you can go to relieve yourselves. Each of you must have a spade as part of your equipment. Whenever you relieve yourself, dig a hole with a spade and cover the uh, excrement. Excrement? Am I saying? Why well, do I feel like I'm saying that wrong? I'm out of sleep. I'm sorry. The camp must be holy. For the Lord your God moves around in your camp to protect you and to defeat your enemies. You must not see any shameful thing among you or he will turn away from you. If slaves should escape from their masters and take refuge with you, you must not hand them over to their masters. Let them live among you in any town they choose and do not oppress them. Interesting. Didn't think about that, but okay. No Israelite, whether man or woman, may become a temple prostitute. When you are bringing an offering to fulfill a vow, you must not bring to the house of the Lord your God any offering from the earnings of a prostitute whether a man or a woman, for both are detestable to the Lord your God. Do not charge interest on the loans you make to a fellow Israelite, whether you loan money or food or anything else. You may charge interest to foreigners, but you may not charge interest to Israelites so that the Lord your God may bless you in everything you do in the land you are about to enter and occupy. Interest is very, it can be very tricky and very unfair when you think about loans and stuff like that, um, I see why God would have said that because we don't want to cause anyone harm as a people, right? Like we want people, we want to treat people fair. And if you need to borrow 20, then 20 is all you need to pay back. We don't want to make people worse off than what they are. When you make a vow to the Lord, your God, be prompt in fulfilling whatever you promise him. For the Lord, your God demands that you promptly fulfill all your vows or you would be guilty of sin. However, it is not a sin to refrain from making a vow. But once you have voluntarily made a vow, be careful to fulfill your promise to the Lord your God. So obviously, later on in scripture, we're, uh, we'll have the scripture that say, you know, let our yes be yes and our no be no. And that is that makes perfect sense because who are we to say that we're going to do anything when we don't know what tomorrow brings? So it's best not to make any vows. But if you do, stick to it. Moderately, for example, if you have pledged in your heart to pay $20 an offering, do that. If you have pledged to pay 100 do that. Um, 
But you can refrain from doing that by saying, okay, Lord, what should I give today? You know, keep it fresh. Um, where am I? When you enter your neighbor's vineyard, you may eat your field of grapes, but you must not carry any away in a basket. And when you enter your neighbor's field of grain, you may pluck the heads of grain with your hand, but you must not harvest it with a sickle. So obviously take a piece. It's being shared to you, but don't take advantage. Um, this pretty much what sums up this right here. Like don't take advantage of people and what they have. Like my uncle used to um, have a, a vineyard and it, man, it was some good grapes <laughs> and they grew beautifully every year. And he sold some, he gave some away. When it was towards the, top, the end of the harvest, he said, hey, y'all come get what y'all want. He done made his share and he made sure to give back. And I truly believe that the Lord's hand was on my uh, uncle anyway. I look at my uncle like a second father, to be honest. Like he's so handy. He put my roof on, he builds porches and um, he never like went to any school or anything. Um, God naturally gave him carpentry, car, 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 what is it? carpentry hands. Sorry. He has, he is naturally gifted to build. And I just thank God because the Lord is with him. And if you call him, he's going to come just like he's our dad. And I, I pray that the Lord continue to bless him. Um, he just recently went through, um, chemo for, you know, getting rid of cancer and God is, is cancer is gone. He's healing to God be the glory. Listen, you be faithful and you be fair and watch God take care of you. All right. That's the end of chapter 23. So that was 21 to 23 y'all. And that was considered day 70, 70, 77 of the 365 reading plan. Talk to me what stood out to you. What was interesting it was a lot for me. I was excited about reading this. Um, God gave me a, a lifted spirit anyway, right before I started and he gave me the availability to do this. But anyway, also I'm in my hideout spot. So that, you know, God is just, I said, God help me, help me to get it done. And he did. So tell me what y'all think. Comment in um, the comment section down below. Please don't forget to like, share, and subscribe on this video because it's going to build a community, y'all. Let's all learn and share together. I love y'all. God bless. Take care. Bye.